Working with Dave Rubeck wasn't always the most pleasant because, uh, I mean, he, personally he was all right. But he never wanted to take too much advice from anybody. But I remember doing Time Out, when we, which became a big record uh, for CBS. And I remember Paul Desmond doing this thing, and, and I loved it. I thought it was great. And Dave never played a solo on the record. I mean, he's thought, boop, doop, 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 boop. There's no, there's no solo on that record by, by uh, Dave Brubeck. But Paul played a beautiful solo. So the record came out, and the record, I sold 35,000 albums, and it didn't do too well. And we had a little brief meeting in Mitch Miller's office. He says, and says, you know, I, I know you, you work hard on this record, but he says, what the hell can we do? He says, you know, it's five, four time, and nobody's going to be able to dance to that. I said, you know, uh, Mitch, I said, you're right. I said, but, you know, give us a little time. So meantime, I had to go to Chicago. I ran into a guy called Granny White. He used to be a promotion guy there. Big, fat guy, black, wonderful personality. And he said, man, man, man. He says, I said, what's wrong? What's wrong, Granny? He says, you, you, man, man, you got a head. You got a head in there. I said, where? He says, take five, take five. I said, oh, I said, you know, I, I, I can't get a single out. No, nobody back at our place is going to do it. I said, what we're going to have to do is figure out a way to get that record out. And I said, I'll tell you what to do. You wait until I get back. I will edit it, that one track. And I said, I will uh, get it ready. And then I want you to send me a telegram <laughs> for 5,000 singles breakout in Chicago. He said, what? I said, yeah, wait till I get back. So I got back. He sends me a telegram. I said, don't send it to me. Send it to the sales department upstairs. And I said, they'll come running down. Meantime, I've got 35 discs. I mean, you, when I was there, in those days, you could do anything you want. If you wanted to order 100 discs in advance, you could do that. So they came running down and said, hey, Tim, man, look, at, man, we got a national breakout, breakout, breakout in Chicago. I said, I said what, what the hell are you talking about? I said, simmer down, you know, calm down a little bit. He said, no, no, man, we got this breakout. We got, we got to move right away. I said, how soon do you have to move? He said, right away, right away. I said, I said okay. I said, well, let me see what I can do. Meantime, I go, I call up the uh, engineering department. They have the records ready for me, 35 or 40 of them, just the acetate, that one track. They shipped them over to me, and we shipped them out to Chicago, and they, they passed them out all over town. It, was, it sold a couple of million. <laughs> oh, and then Dave never, he never gave me credit for that record. But it was Granny White and myself, and then the, and then about two years later, Paul Desmond calls me and says to me, T, I'd like to talk to you. I say, hey, Paul, you know, what's up? He says, you know, I think you got the wrong take. <laughs> I said, oh, gee, don't tell me that. I said, it couldn't have been the wrong take because I said, I went over there and did the editing myself. He said, it's the wrong take. I said, have you been to the to the bank lately with the, with the royalty statement? He said, yeah, we're selling like hotcakes. I said, goodbye, Paul. <laughs> and I hung up on him. I said, you know, I would try to tell him, forget about it. You know, I, I couldn't change it then. If I wanted to, it would be impossible. Then I worked with, with, uh, with Miles, and we did some of the greatest records ever made. Now, the ones with Miles Davis, he would never finish a record. I mean, after four track, when it became eight track and sixteen tracks, he would he would he would play on the sessions, turn his turn his mic off, or walk away, or pack up, and said and walk out the door. And I said, well, "Hey, Miles, you 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 can't you can't just walk out. Why don't we finish this goddamn thing?" And he and he would never answer me. I said, yeah, "Well, come on." And he said, no, I, I, this is it. So I would take the tapes, go through them, edit them, and I'd call him up. I said, look, I'm setting up an acetate or an album, whatever, a, a big a disc, 
33. I said, if you don't like it, I'll redo it again, you know. I said, but see what you could, see what you like about it. He'd call up, he'd call me back. He said, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, it sounds okay. I said, you mean it's all right to go with that? Yeah, yeah, you did, you did, you did okay. And this is, this is through his entire career at CBS, because he came to the editing room maybe five times in 29, 30 years, and there are a couple of times when he, he came in and he did, uh, oh, I think it was in a silent way. I had already mixed, I don't know, maybe 40 reels of tape, quarter-inch tapes, and I said, look, if you want to come down, be my guest. I said, I could do it. I know what's there. I've gone through it all. I said, so he came down. This is one of the rare times, and we, we sat for about three hours, and he said, I don't like that. I said, well, yeah, I don't like that either. The guy's just playing a lot of notes and doing that. So we, we edited the, the 40 reels of quarter-inch tapes down to two boxes. And in the two boxes, we edited it down to eight and a half minutes on one side, and then the other side was maybe, maybe nine minutes. Miles gets up and says, I'm leaving. I said, wait a minute, you can't leave now. I said, you know, I got, I got about 18 minutes here. You know, we put this record out. I said, they're going to have your head in the platter, and they're going to have mine too. I said, just leave me alone for a couple of days. So what I did, I played it through again, and I cut it all up. And I made pieces, and I made bridges, and I stretched out, and I moved things around. With the, with the 18 minutes that I had, I had to go to uh, uh, two sides, so it had to be something like uh, uh, 40 minutes or 50 minutes of music. And what I did, I cut it and I pasted it up and I put it back together again. Now the same material is there for almost 40 minutes, maybe even longer. I never did really finally had the final uh, time on it. And I put it together and the record became a classic. And then. Uh, a lot of people at CBS said, oh, anybody could have done it. I said, no, but not anybody could have done it. I said, to be able to do that, first of all, you had to have an ear. There was no scores. You had to have a mind. And, I, and if you want to become a producer, uh, I don't know about the audience, if some of these kids want to be, they really should study music. So you should learn orchestration. They should learn how to do all these things you know, prior to getting into the studio, because once you get in there, you know, it's easy to say take one, take two, take three. But anyway, we made the record, the record became a classic. In a silent way, I don't know, it must have sold a couple of million. I have no way of knowing it. I, and then, but uh, just recently, Joe Zamanoff, they conned, in, conned him into uh, using the outtakes. And I said, please, if you want to use the outtakes, do it in a different format or give it away as a, an archival kind of thing, you know, to the students. Don't destroy the original record because a lot of work went into that. But they did manage to put all the crap back in. And I called up Joe Zavanoff and I really gave him hell for it. I said, look, don't do it. But if, you, if you're that hungry for the money, then do it. And he did it. I guess he wanted the money. I guess I don't know how much money he got out of it. but. but that was the way I used to Miles do Miles Davis's records, edit them, and put them all together in piece by piece by piece. He would walk out of the studios. I remember one time he came into the studio. He was going to kill me, and he said, "You white motherfucker, Bob." You, I said, "What's what's wrong, Ma?" He said, "I want you to kill that secretary here." I said, "That girl will do anything for you, outside of something she's not going to do for you." I said, "But she, she's in your corner," and he he, he said, "I'm coming over to kill you, hit me." I said, "Come over, you son of a bitch! I'm here." I meantime I called the president, president of God of Liberty, and I said, "Look, well, I think there may be a fight here shortly." He said, "You think he needs some help?" I said, "No, I'm, I think I can handle it." He says, well, do, do the best you can. <laughs> and finally, Miles packed up his horn, went out the studio door. Two minutes later, he goes back in, and he takes his trumpet out. I said, put the machines on. I said, you son of a bitch, if I come out, 
to see you, I'm going to throw up all over you. And you hear me? And the musicians were still mulling around. They, were, they didn't pay, the, pay him any mind at all. So finally I got up out of the chair in the control booth and I went outside. And I stood next to the son of a bitch, shoulder to shoulder, just as hard as I could press. And they, the, the machines were running and they played one of the greatest solos of the world. I can't remember. It was one of the big records that we made. And then afterwards I said, you son of a bitch. I said, we should do this every goddamn time. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is what I would, I mean, he would, he would uh, leave the studio on, on other occasions. And then he asked one of his guys to come in and get me. And we would sit for 15, 20 minutes and not say one word. And then he finally would turn to me and he said, well, what about it? I don't know, he, he grabs his, he goes to the studio, I run into the control, I said, put the machines on, put the machines on. And we would record, I said, that's it, job finished, everybody go home. So to be a producer, you have to be a psychiatrist, a doctor, hey doctor, I, I didn't know too much about being a doctor in those days, but I did have a few, a few words in my vocabulary that were of great use to me over the years, especially with somebody like Miles, because I didn't let him intimidate me. And you really can't let the artist intimidate. If you really want to be a strong producer and a producer that makes, you know, halfway decent records, I have, I've had bosses that used to, used to uh, call me in their office and said, we just got the acetates of Miles' session yesterday and it sounds like crap. I said, well, yeah, it does sound like crap. I mean, but you know, I'm not going to use all of that garbage. I'm just going to edit what I think should be part of the record and we'll put it out. 